I'm Victor Gallegos, the uh, general manager, director of winemaking at Sea Smoke. You're sitting in Sea Smoke right now. I got here at the beginning of 2002, just before we had any wine in the marketplace to sell. In 98, uh, Bob Davids, who founded the company, had been a big Burgundy collector. He had ba been based in Hong Kong at that time. He ran a, what was essentially a small toy company that he took from about 30 employees to several thousand. And while he was in Hong Kong, became a huge fan of Burgundy. When he decided to make his last career uh, one of producing world-class Pinot Noir, he looked around the world, New Zealand and a variety of places in the New World, ended up focusing here on Santa Rita Hills and was helped by Bill Wathen over at Fox and Bruno Galfonso, a couple of other folks. And he traveled around the Santa Rita Hills and kept finding properties and asking Bill Wathen to come and tell him whether this was a good place or not. Billy kept coming along and saying, no, actually, Bob, you don't want that. And Bob's response finally was, well, Billy, why don't you just tell me what I do want and uh, we can cut to the chase. So Billy took him out on Santa Rosa Road and they looked across from basically where Sanford is right now. They looked across the river uh, to a bench and Billy said, well, that's what you want, but we've all wanted it for 20 years and you're not gonna get it. So uh, that was a challenge for Bob. Ultimately, obviously he got it. and. None of that property. He bought the westernmost 350 acres of Rancho Chihuchu, which was essentially a 900-acre horse ranch. Of those 350 acres, about 100, 105 were plantable. So he acquired that property, planted all of it in 1999. And uh, then about a year later, we convinced Pedro he could actually get the tractor and do another half an acre. And so that was planted as well. That's on where you and I walked this afternoon, which was K block, which is about a 35% slope. So it's, it's pretty hairy. And that was the genesis of Sea Smoke. Well, you know, Sea Smoke has been very lucky. I mean, obviously it's an amazing site. Uh, it's a great team and it's been a lot of hard work, but there's also been a lot of luck. And part of that luck was quite frankly timing. When Bob got here in 98, there were a handful of, of wineries, and I'm talking specifically right now about the Santa Rita Hills, there were a handful of wineries already in place and or planted. Jim Lalby loved the wines and um, actually gave Sea Smoke really glowing reviews in addition to the rest of the Appalachian, and it took off. Uh, it was from that day forward, we didn't have the supply to meet demand. and. That the story was similar for most of the Santa, wineries in the Santa Rita Hills from that day onward as well. Obviously, I think it was 04 uh, that Sideways came out, which was about a year later, and, and uh, that just took it to another level. Now, Sea Smoke appeared in the, in the movie as one of the bottles of wine that they drank. Um, did yeah. that, that specific quick scene have a direct impact, do you think, on Sea Smoke's um, fame or, or demand? Yeah. Well, we di actually didn't know that that scene was going to happen. The director of the movie was a Sea Smoke List member prior and had wanted to shoot on the vineyard. And uh, we loved the idea, but as it got closer and closer to shoot date, obviously the shooting was going to coincide with harvest. We have one thing that we do one time a year. We can't put it at risk. So uh, I basically called him and said, hey, sorry, we're not going to be able to shoot there. It's just too complicated, but we'll send you some wine sorry, hope you enjoy it. And the wine ended up in the movie. For us, um, internally, if you talk, there's only six uh, employees at Sea Smoke, but if you talk to Katie Kennison, who runs our list, she'll tell you, well, that is the day that the conversations changed. So up to that point, it was sort of all of Sea uh, Smoke and our list members, we loved each other, sat around and held hands and sang Kumbaya. And the day that that movie came out, the phone started ringing and it changed to very sort of aggressive conversations and nobody understood why we were sold out or if the movie was going to our heads. And, and um, so it, it was a lot less fun. But for the Valley in general, it did great things uh, for the restaurants, for most of the businesses, particularly on the east end of the Valley. It was, it was a huge boon.
and definitely put, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you recall the speech about Pinot Noir in the movie, it put Pinot Noir from this area on the map for sure. Yeah. Our list got so big, it's real, probably when our wait list kicked in uh, in 05 that things got really crazy. And we're lucky again that uh, we're able to remain a small team. Again, we're only six people here, and so Katie handles most of the calls, uh, but she's really good. And so it's, I, I wouldn't point to an exact moment, but certainly those early years were far more frenetic for sure, you know, the, this part of the business, this high-end Pinot Noir business, has traditionally been um, driven by one of two things, either scores, and anybody would be lying if they said that those don't play a part. They certainly do. Uh, but also by sort of site-driven wines. And there are folks in this business, even here in the Valley you can talk to, who don't submit their wines for scores anymore to the major players, and actually see some of doesn't either anymore. Uh, but those site-driven wines really rely on, and whether you want to call them wines, you know, people use varying expressions, whether it's world-class wines or vinos de alta expresión if you're in Spain, or, or just really site-driven wines. What we're relying on is for the land to speak and for people who are buying those wines year in and year out to be really psyched about what's coming off that piece of dirt. And ultimately, that's what has you know, led to Sea Smoke's success. Because a score is great, but somebody drinking that wine, at the end of the day, the score just is the first entree. They have to really enjoy. They have to be hedonistic about you know, what they're experiencing. And if that isn't there, it's only happening one time, score or not. So at the end of the day, consumers trust their own palates and they own, their own joy out of what they're drinking. So what, um, you know, what, is, what, what makes Sea Smoke different than so many other wines from this region? Um, why did it, why did it stood out so much? At the end of the day, it comes back to the piece of dirt. I mean, it's, you've been there. It's an amazing sight. It, if you don't go to that spot and stand there, you kind of don't in some way get the joke of what sea smoke is. It's, it's based on that piece of land. And the reason we don't buy grapes is because we are true terroirs. We believe our own hype in the sense that we couldn't make sea smoke from another piece of land. So that's, that sounds like somewhat of a trite answer, but in our case, it all comes back to that. Yes, there's a fantastic team. Yes, we work our butts off. Uh, and Yes, we've been lucky, <laughs> for sure, but I'll take luck. Uh, but at the end of the day, it comes back to that piece of dirt. You, let's say that you were somebody like Bob Davids, the owner of Sea Smoke, who um, had done well, and you have some money, and wine is your passion, and you're looking for some place in the world to grow Pinot Noir. And obviously, if you're a Pinot Noir lover, by extension, generally, you're a Burgundy lover. That's the standard, and rightfully so. And if you used that as your basis and you said, well, what's made Burgundy successful over the years? Let me look at that and see where I might duplicate that success. And if you started taking those parameters and looked at the Santa Rita Hills, at first glance, this place looks truly like a spectacularly bad idea. I mean, Burgundy more or less is at the latitude of, of the Willamette Valley. Right now, you're sitting at the latitude of Tunisia. So that is strike one, <laughs> right? Um, second, Burgundy is a fairly wet place, given the latitude. And right here, we're in the middle of a semi-desert called Southern California, 10 inches of rain or so a year. So that's strike two. In the case of sea smoke, then you're at 650 feet of elevation, all south facing. So any concerns you had about the solar intensity of being at the latitude of Tunisia would just be amplified by those factors. The big mitigating factor as you stood up at the top of the vineyard and looked out west is Point Concepcion, and it's where the coast of California changes from running north to south to running west to east, and I won't get into the plate tectonics and all of that stuff, but essentially the ranges there, the coastal range gets shunted onto its side, the San Inez range forms the base of a funnel, and on a normal growing season day, it'll be 82, 85 degrees at sea smoke. At 
four in the afternoon when the inversion has occurred in San Inez and there's a huge sucking sound, it drops to 52 degrees to 55 degrees. 75% humidity and you need a coat standing in that same spot where you were sweating an hour ago. So that's what makes what would otherwise really not be a Pinot Noir region a Pinot Noir region. And as a viticulturalist, for me, the big kind of aha moment in all of this is that this place, meaning the Santa Rita Hills, is the southernmost or I guess most equatorial region one microclimate that's ever been uh, uncovered. Region one, meaning UC Davis created a microclimate classification system many years ago that's based on a, a degree days and heat summation. But essentially it's uh, regions one, two, three, four, five, one being the coolest. And Pinot Noir is essentially a region one. It finds its best expression in a region one, low region two microclimate. So this is a region one with the solar intensity from being at the latitude of Tunisia. So it's this really odd mixture of, of ripeness and intensity coupled with high acidity and balance, which gives, quite frankly, all of the wines in, in this AVA their, their character, which is, in my opinion, really unusual. Well, I think, and again, we need to separate that conversation between sort of um, everyday table wines, which you know, are really important and the wines that we've been talking about now sort of wines of high expression wines or, or world class types of wines. At that level, um, I think any winemaker that's being honest with you will tell you somewhere between eight, at least 80% of what that wine is going to be is already, that story is already written in the vineyard before the grapes come in. Um, so that gives you part of the answer. And, and so then the winemaker is really controlling maybe 20% of that. The winemaker is certainly important, but arguably the land is a great deal more important. And then if you take that a step further and you say, well, okay, for example, in the case of sea smoke, uh, there are vineyard workers who are doing essentially eight hand operations per vine per year, meaning they're touching each individual wine or vine about eight different times. Well, if that's accounting for 80% of what's going to be in that wine, I would argue they should get a hell of a lot more respect than they do. Who should be the rock star in that scenario? Uh, you know, as Americans, we love to create rock stars, whether that's musicians or actors or sports figures or what have you. And it's part of our cultural identity. And that like so many other things, that has a, a, a positive side and a negative side. The positive side, obviously, is that if you're not yet the rock star, you want to be the rock star, and so it drives you to succeed. The negative side of that is that, you know, most of us know that your, you know, taking us as examples, your success and my success in this life is rarely a function exclusively of our own efforts. We are usually aided a great deal by those around us. And the same is true in, in pursuits that we're making rock stars out of people. Uh, so the negative side of that coin is that it really devalues the contribution of the people who are really helping make things happen, whether that's the person in the vineyard who we just discussed is you know, responsible for perhaps 80% of the final product, or the assistant winemaker, or the enologist, or the cellar master, or the lowly director of winemaking in my case. <laughs> You know, they're all important, an important part of the, the picture. And I think the emphasis on making individual personalities rock stars uh, in some ways misses the point. Yeah, well, the, the one that stands out for me is, uh, I think it was um, maybe a year after Sideways came out, uh, Virginia Madsen, who's one of the lead actresses in that movie, showed up at Sea Smoke, walked in the door. You know, we were in the ghetto. Uh, in behind um, Home Depot, the wine ghetto in Lapo. And she walked in one of the roll-up doors. She said, hey, and we all kind of looked at her and she said, yeah, she looks oddly familiar. And um, she said, yeah, you know what? I'd really love to buy a case of 10. And well, we didn't have any wine to sell her. And, but we realized after a minute, you know, the word got around and, and uh, 
so we all kind of looked at each other. And the most embarrassing thing was trying to figure out which one of us, the employees, was going to give up our own personal line <laughs> so she could walk out with a case because it was going to be one of, we weren't going to sit her home with nothing, but one of us was going to have to give up, you know, out of our own cell or our wine. And so it was, you know, we were drawing straws on the side to see who got to lose their wine. But there hasn't been, luckily we've been kind of under the radar. Nobody can find where we are. You notice there wasn't a sign on the building. So uh, we, we can generally avoid those kind of conversations. Well, to, um, to those who are list members, thank you for your support over the years. And those who are on the waiting list, I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> Stick with us and we'll do our best.